All right, so today we are covering bubble reshuffling. Uh, this is a process through which we take a non-CMOS implementable production rule set, and we, are, and we do our best to make it CMOS implementable. Um, and we do this by kind of moving inverters away from isochronic forks and onto non-isochronic uh, forks or wires. Um, so that we can actually have inverters without violating our isochronic fork assumption. Um, it's not always possible to do this for every production rule set. And so uh, I'll, I'll also be presenting an alternative method in which we take the same concept and push it back up the uh, synthesis flow into state variable insertion. Um, that is an experimental idea and not necessarily proven to work yet, but uh, it seems to be the next step. All right. So, so far we've taken our CHP specification for our streaming buffer. We've turned it into handshaking expansions, done simulation and state variable insertion to eliminate conflicting states. Uh, and then we have done guard strengthening to generate a production rule set. And that's where we left off last lecture. Uh, we added you know, reset rules and environment rules to be able to simulate it. And uh, now we need to run bubble reshuffling. And so bubble reshuffling builds a graph based upon the set of production rules um, with arcs leading from one variable to another. And there's a tool that does this automatically. Uh, it's called Bubble. It's in the Haystack uh, synthesis engine. Uh, and it will actually generate SVG files rendering each step that it takes. And so you can see the command to execute that up there. Now it's uh, emitting an error, which I will be talking about uh, later in the lecture. And that is basically saying that this production rule set can't be fully bubble reshuffled, right? It is not possible to make this production rule set uh, implementable in CMOS, uh, and we'll discuss why. And so in order to build this graph, let's start with uh, a production rule. So we're gonna start with r.r. And so we notice we have r.r up here, and we have r.r down, and we're gonna work our way through all the terms in, this, in these two production rules and generate arcs from uh, those terms out to our driven node r.r. Now, because r.r acknowledges both, um, both the up and down transitions on reset, the arc that we draw from reset to r.r is solid, right? It is not an isochronic fork. Then we go to l.e, and again, r.r acknowledges both transitions on l.e. However, notice that uh, the, the terms for L.E are inverted with respect to where they need to be for CMOS implementability, right? So this is saying when L.E is high, raise R.R, and we can't do that in a, in a CMOS uh, pull-up network, right? We need to use PMOS transistors, and this uh, kind of suggests an NMOS transistor. And here we need to use a an NMOS transistor in this term suggests a PMOS. And so when we draw our arc, we see that we have a little bubble at the end of the arc, right? Saying that this rule, uh, basically there's an inverter that needs to be placed there. So then we go on and, and draw our arc for R.E. Again, it's inverted with respect to where it needs to be for CMOS implementability. Uh, then we draw the arc for L.R. And the transition on r.r only acknowledges the upgoing transition on l.r. It does not acknowledge the downgoing transition, which means that this is an isochronic fork. And furthermore, it's an isochronic fork with an inversion at the end, right? So we're gonna need to move that bubble away from this arc in this graph, right? That's gonna be one of our goals. Then we draw the arc for V1, and it's, you know, it's all good with respect to CMOS implementability for the rules on R.R. Now, if we do this for the rest of the production rules, we'll get a fully, 
you know, elaborated bubble reshuffling graph. And we can see we have a variety of different isochronic forks uh, and a variety of different places where we need to move bubbles off of those isochronic forks. And so we, do, we can move bubbles around now by inverting uh, an entire production role, right? And so let's take a look at V2. We have bubbles on two isochronic forks in uh, coming into V2. And then we have another isochronic fork from R dot R, and then non, and then we have kind of normal terms for V1 and, and LE and reset, right? And so if we invert V2 and, and make it underscore V2, right? So all of these production rules that had V2, the, the sense has been inverted. Right, then what happens is the bubbles now shift from the isochronic forks they used to be on to all of the other uh, branches off of this node that they, that they didn't used to be on, right? However, now we've added a bubble onto this isochronic fork uh, on R.R. .R. So now we need to do the same thing for R.R. .R. We invert R.R. .R. and we now have underscore R. And we've moved the bubbles off of the majority of isochronic forks, right? We have a we have a bubble here, we have a bubble here, we have a bubble here. The only bubble on an isochronic fork now is this one going into LE. However, if we were to invert LE, we would simply move this bubble onto this isochronic fork, then we'd have to invert LR, move the bubble onto this isochronic fork and then invert RR and we'd be back where we started, right? And so we have this negative cycle, which means that we can't actually solve this problem. Okay. So the next thing is um, we need to start actually placing these inverters in our production rule set. Um, and so we can create the inverted version of reset and then replace all of the inverted terms in all the production rules as needed. Uh, we can notice that it's replaced for everything but V1, right? Reset is not replaced in V1. And that's because we have a bubble on the incoming uh, terms for reset for everything but V1, right? So for our underscore RR, we have a bubble. For LE, we have a bubble. And for underscore V2, we have a bubble. V1 is the only one without a bubble. So that's reset. And then we need to handle underscore RR into RE, right? And so we create uh, a... Uh, an inverter from underscore RR to RR, and we use that to drive RE. And then we need to handle the bubble for LE into LR. So we create an inverter on LE and use it to drive LR. And then we need to handle V2, right? So there's a bubble here from, from uh, underscore V2 to V1 and from underscore V2 to LE, right? These two bubbles. And so we create an inverter from underscore V2 to V2, and we replace the terms and the rules for LE and V1. And then we need to do the same thing for V1 into RR. So there's a bubble here from V1 into underscore RR. We create an inverter and switch over the terms in RR. And this is basically as far as we can get, right? So this is where we run into our, uh, you know, a couple of different things. So this error is saying that it found a gating signal in the production rules for V2. And what that says is that there is a term, right? R underscore RR, which is found in both the upgoing and downgoing rules for V2 that has the same sense, right? They're both 
positive sense, which means that we can't actually fix that issue. Because however we fix it, we'll be putting a, uh, an inverter on an isochronic fork. Finally, we have that negative cycle between underscore RR, L dot E, and L dot R that we can't fix. And that's shown here in red. All right, so this production rule set, we can't actually solve. So this is where we get into an unproven alternative. Now, previously, we used HSE encoder to find conflicting uh, places, right? Conflicting state encodings in the HSE and disambiguate them with state variable insertion. However, we can do the same thing, right? Except that when we when we look for state conflicts, we only use the terms that are of the right sense for the transition in question, right? So for an upgoing transition, we can only use uh, information in our state encoding from uh, variables which are currently low. And for downgoing transitions, we can only use information in our state encoding for variables that are currently high. And so that has, you know, HSE encoder has support to do that with two new options, dash CU and dash CD. So here's the output with CU and CD. And if we go back, here's the output with just dash C. Right, and so what's happening is you have um, basically, you've got state information that you're not allowed to use, and that's being used to deconflict a bunch of states in the handshaking expansion for dash C. But when you decide not to use that information, suddenly you have a whole bunch of new conflicts for both upgoing and downgoing rules. Right, so this for, if you look at dash CD, this is saying L dot R down conflicts with this place after L dot R up, R dot R down conflicts, R dot R down conflicts again, L dot E down, R dot R down, right? These are all the downgoing rules. And then for CU, we have all the upgoing rules, L dot R up, R dot R up, R dot R up, right? It just keeps going. So unfortunately, Inserting, inserting state variables to solve those conflicts is not easy, right? It's a lot harder than the state variable insertion problem uh, that we originally presented. So when you take a look at this example and you insert all the necessary state variables and uh, add inverters in order to deconflict this HSE, you end up with this which is quite a bit more complex, has more state variables, and now we've added explicit inverters on signals that are happening, that are running in parallel, right? And so that's these two processes. So we now have a V3 because underscore RR up needs information about V1, but can't use it. And so we have to insert a downgoing transition on, on a new variable in order to give r underscore r r up the information it needs about v one. So then, when we were to if we render this as production rule, uh, or when we render this as production rules, that's going to be something like uh, v one positive is then going to drive v three negative. Yep. And so now that we have this uh, HSC, we can you know run it through our same flow right, uh, elaborate the state space and generate production rules through guard strengthening. Except this time when running guard strengthening, we only use terms which we're allowed to use, you know, that create uh, CMOS implementable production rules. And so now we don't have to run bubble reshuffling once we've generated production rules. So this whole sequence is very much a uh, theory, right? It is not proven. It is a, hey, what if we did this? 
right? The thing that makes this flow difficult is that you can, it's a, it's a very large search space for a final compilation, right? From a CHP all the way down to a final compilation. And you can go through that search space and end up at a dead end. You can expand the HSE in a way that is uh, that creates instabilities. You can uh, you can insert uh, state variables that aren't usable by uh, CMOS implementable rules. You can insert you can create an HSE that uh, doesn't have room for statusizers or doesn't include statusizers. You can uh, create um, a production rule set that uh, has negative cycles of isochronic forks that you can't move uh, the inverter off of, right? All of these uh, kind of uh, trap cases with such a wide search space is what makes this compilation procedure um, so far elusive. So then what was the motivation for exploring uh, state variable insertion that eliminates the need for bubble reshuffling? Like what suggests that might be um, a path that would produce some effective results? Going back to bubble reshuffling, we ended up with this negative cycle, right? And so the negative cycle is a cycle of isochronic forks with an inverter on them. Right, and so it's actually not possible to solve this in bubble reshuffling, but this is solvable by inserting a state variable while bubble reshuffling. And so if we do state variable insertion and bubble reshuffling on the state space simultaneously, then this we, it resolves this negative cycle problem. So then if we were to run bubble on the, uh on the handshake expansion encoding with state variable insertion that only use the currently up and currently down information, it would still produce a graph and that graph would be cycle free. It would be negative cycle free. You can still have cycles, right? That are cycles of non-isochronic forks because you're allowed to have inverters on non-isochronic forks, but it will be free of negative cycles, right? So here's a cycle of non-isochronic forks following the solid lines between reset underscore RR and V1. And you're allowed to have an inverter on there. So, okay, I understand that you can have cycles and that if the negative cycle that you want to eliminate and we're looking at this graph, that negative cycle is through the dotted lines uh, and one of those dotted lines has a bubble on it indicating that it, needs an, that it is converted. And now that you confirm, so where this cycle is, this negative cycle is traveling from LE underscore RR and LR. So then is it, so the transitions are directed and we are, for example, going from LR to LE and underscore RR. And so if we trace the dotted lines, we do have to go backwards, as it were, along at least one of the transitions. Bubbles, when you invert a, uh, a transition like LE, bubbles will, uh, you know, can traverse that arc effectively in any direction. The directionality of the arc ultimately doesn't matter in bubble, bubble reshuffling. It just tells you where, you know, which direction the inverter is facing. That makes sense. And that also means that when you're examining the graph, all that matters is uh, the presence of a cycle and not necessarily a directed cycle, as it were. Correct. Well, okay, so then we look, if we look at the uh, state space, sorry, the state variable insertion proposal for this, uh, the insertion or the, the amendment to include explicit inverters in parallel. I guess, how do those come to be? What is the rationale to which they're constructed? As of now, it is unclear. 
right? Um, we'd have to probably construct the bubble reshuffling graph on top of the uh, elaborated state space based upon the information that is available in the uh, state encodings. But it's unclear uh, whether having too much information in the state encoding will make the graph problematic in terms of the bubble reshuffling algorithm. Okay, so here where there were explicit or there are explicit uh, inverting transitions running in parallel, those were constructed by the uh, EGC encoding tool. This is all by hand. And to be clear, this is not in the literature. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting then. So we are in lecture 18. And we have e1.prs, which has our uh, non bubble reshuffled production rules, right, with the fully closed system. And we have e2.hse, right, which we can deconflict using the directional conflict checker. So if we run bubble, uh, right, we can uh, run it against our PRS, so e1.prs. And it'll generate our error, and it'll generate bubble.prs. Now, if we want to, we can have it also print each step that it takes with the dash r option. And we'll render it to PNG. Uh, it doesn't have graph is dot. All right. And so we can render each individual step graph using dot. Now I need to install dot into the uh, broccoli command line interface so that we can render those. Uh, but you can see each step that it takes and verify it along the way. So now we have bubble.prs, right, with all of our new inverters. And uh, this will still run in PRSIM. Right, so if, if we take prsim bubble.prs, so we need to use the haystack version of prsim because of the format. It doesn't have uh, the same format on the input. And we set the reset rules. So set reset up, step 1,000, set reset down, step 1,000, and it runs. And it runs without um, a an instability, and we can keep doing this for a long time. Okay. Then, if we take a look at E two, there are a couple of things to note. First, is that HSC sim is integrated into Vim, right? Second, so is the uh, HSC encoder, right? So this is that using the dash C option. Uh, in Vim, the command is colon C. And so if we want to do uh, to see the upgoing uh, conflicts, we can say colon C U. And now we see all the conflicts in the upgoing rules. OK. So L.R up is currently conflicting with L.R down, right, with this semicolon, because it cannot use the information in the state space about L.E. Right, that's our first conflict or T0, which is here. And so in order to deconflict this, we would need to 
add a rule, which is the inverse, right? So underscore LR up for reset, and then underscore LR down, followed by LR up, and then underscore LR up, followed by LR down. And so now we save it, and then we rerun the conflict checker, and that conflict on LR is gone. Are there any other ways of resolving the conflict outside of introducing sequential inversion? You can introduce a parallel inverter, right? As I did in the example in the lecture here. Basically, our options are parallel inverter or sequenced inverter, effectively, right? It's still an inverter in the end result. Um, one is probably easier to read than another. But in general, now we're inserting state variables that aren't just state variables. Let's take a look at another one. We have r dot r up, and it seems to be conflicting with just about everything in that state space. In fact, that's all the upgoing conflicts is r dot r up. So let's, so we know that r dot r up can't use this information in the guard from le and re and lr, right? Because it's an upgoing transition. So let's add underscore rr. And we're going to reset it high. And then we're going to lower it in between the guard and RR up. And we're going to raise it in between this guard and RR down. OK. Let's save and rerun our conflict checker. All right, so now we only have one conflict in the upgoing production rule set. Underscore RR up is firing before LE down. So it's firing here. So effectively, um, underscore RR up Well, it should be able to use the information about LE down. But this doesn't have any way to, this transition doesn't have any way to know that it's not waiting for LE down. And so it will conflict. Right, so here we actually need our state variable. And in particular, we need to know that our state variable is low here and high here. So we probably want our state variable to go down here. And then we probably want it to go uh, up somewhere around here. Now, we could make it go up after RR down down here so that we don't run into, I oh know we'll still run into a, a conflict there. So let's just try, try this, V0 up. And we're going to create the reset. So V0 starts high. And let's see what that does. So now we have two new production rules. Perhaps we should start with V0 being low. And have V0 high here and V0 low here, as we did in the original conflict um, solution.
Okay, so V0 up is now conflicting with a couple of places. So if we look at our existing conflicts, we use colon C, right? And we remember our previous solution here. Let's try to implement that, right? So let's try to resolve these conflicts with another transition here that uses uh, V1 down after R dot R up. and V1 up after V0 up. Okay, that solves the uh, base conflicts. Let's check CU. Okay, we still have a conflict here with V1 and V0. All right. Uh, so now we need to have something in between here. All right, so let's add V3. And let's try inverting after V0. So V3 down and then V3 up here. All right, we still have a conflict here. Maybe we can implement V3 in parallel with the transition on LE. There it is. So this kind of demonstrates something I was curious about. Uh, here it was, uh, if not, we don't know if it was necessary, but it was effective to implement a parallel construction as opposed to just continuing to add sequential inversions. Yes, uh, and that's part of what makes state variable insertion difficult, is that sometimes it is necessary to avoid uh, over constraining the state space and adding more conflicts. Because we don't actually need L.E to wait for V3. We don't care. OK, so let's check the downgoing conflicts. We have two of them. V0 down is firing. Uh, right after V1 up. And the reason is because it can't use this information about RR down. And so perhaps we actually need V3 up, semicolon V0 down, semicolon LE. Let's check the up going. That's good. Let's check the down going. That's good. OK, we've resolved it. And so notice that we have this V0, V3, V3, V0. That's a latch. Right? That's an internal memory. Now, guard strengthening will probably turn that into a, a pair of C elements. But it is, it is possible to add the necessary combinational logic to turn that into a latch. And we'd like to avoid that kind of state holding as much as possible. Well, unfortunately, a, a state holding element is actually necessary here because of the uh, multiple sends on R, right? 
And so you, if you were to implement this using templated synthesis, you would use a latch in your normal handshake, right? You'd use an internal memory instruction. If we had two solutions, one of which say had a, a string of B0, B1, B3, B4, B5, and it's constructing a couple of latches in sequence. Um, and then this compared to this one, we prefer the one which is more parsimonious in terms of state holding. Right. Um, we want to avoid state holding elements in general, but the the thing to note is that uh, a latch as a state holding element is kind of preferred over a C element as a state holding element. Um, and that's because they're combinational. And so, and it's it's really hard to tell where C elements are gonna appear as state holding elements. Generally, they appear as state holding elements when you have something like this, um, where it's basically, let's see, where you have, so anytime you have signal up, signal down, and then signal down, where is it? Uh, signal down, signal up, right? That'll be a pull up network and pull down network. And if it's if you're multiple if you have multiple signals here that are going down and multiple signals here that are going up, that then imply the upgoing rule on the next one and the downgoing rule on the next one, then you'll get a C element, right? And so, for example, here, this is L E and R E and L and L R. That's the pull down network for a C element, and you can recognize that it's a C element by looking at the pull up network, V1, not V1 and not RE driving RR high. So anytime you have a um, sequence of upgoing transitions driving a downgoing, same, you know, similar sequence of downgoing driving an upgoing, you're gonna have a C element. What's good here is that we have space for a staticizer because of this inverter, right? Because of R at R. That means that we've done a good job. But the thing is, how do you tell all of this in an automated context, right? How do you avoid state holding elements, right? C elements in a state in a in an automated context and recognize this in a state space? I think that's probably not a solved problem yet. There does appear to be a syntactic rule that can be observed because you can identify, in this case, uh, underscore RR driven down and up, and then uh, observe that there are guards which are going to uh, comprise the pull down fault network, respectively. What's unclear is whether or not it's possible to add in the combinational logic, right? the basically vacuous firings, vacuous guards, to make that rule combinational. And that's something I don't know how to recognize from the HSE. Because you can just start by saying, by default, everything is a C element and go from there, right? By default, everything is state holding. Now what? How do we make it not? At what point in the flow do those vacuous, uh, vacuous guards become explicit? Or do they? They don't. Okay. Uh, you will have to, basically, you'd have to derive your production rules all the way to the end, all the way to here, and then go back and look at this state space to see what things you can add into these guards to make them combinational without breaking your production rule set. And then the question becomes, how do you reshuffle this HSE and add state variables in such a way that it encourages combinational logic, right? There are a whole bunch of, un that, of open questions at this point in the flow. And that would still uh, be built on top of an, automatic, an automated guard strengthening mechanism that can handle um, more complex transition graphs than just these sequential transitions currently works for. Yep.